We'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Before I read that, I, often in my life, people come up to me and ask me, when you go into ministry, especially people that are going to be pastors, what, is, what matters the most? What is the most important thing that in, in ministry that we should get involved with? And usually my answer is very sophisticated. Oh. And then turn around and I would somehow say, well, what does the Word of God say in regard to that? What matters most? And I would read often from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, which I'll read with you now. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. <coughs> if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. What is the most important thing you see here? This is, you could say something. What do you see in those verses? What matters the most? Who does it matter the most to? God and other people. It matters the most. It's difficult, very difficult for people to really understand that God is a loving and forgiving God. It kind of unsettles them. They're not sure they can believe that. What is equally unsettling and people can't wrap their arms around is the fact that God is not only a loving God, but loving is the most important matter. In, in T.S. Eliot, in one of his essays or poems, asked that question, what matters most? What is it in life that really matters? And throughout our lives, we live our lives trying to make that decision all the time. Any thoughtful person does it. If you're sitting here and you're a husband or a wife, you ask yourself, what matters? My wife, my husband, what matters? My children, what matters? The, my job and where I work, what matters? The service I give to the church of Jesus Christ, what is it that matters? What is it that really, really matters? What is it that has significance? And the answer of the Word of God, the thing that matters most is love. The question is profound. What matters? What matters most? But how do you decide? How do you decide what is it that matters the most? You face it all the time in your life and these questions come at you all the time. But how do you decide between what matters and what matters most, what really matters? But the question is really deeper, much deeper, when you have to deal with the question of what really matters and how do you decide? Now, all kinds of things take place here in the church. In every church, everywhere you go, many of these things take place. If we ask, uh, when I was in seminary, I remember when you asked your homiletics professor, what is the most important thing that I should learn here in seminary? What would he say? Preaching. But after all, if you've got everything in your brain and you can't communicate it and you can't talk about it, then it doesn't matter, does it? If you ask the, uh, your doctrinal teacher, the, uh, theology, thinking, 
You know, what is the most important thing? You have to learn to think. You have to be doct you have to be biblically and doctrinally secure and accurate. You ask different professors different things. And I remember when I asked my teacher for exegesis, oh, the most important thing, no doubt about it, is the languages. How can you study the word of God, Charlie, if you don't know your Greek and you don't know your Hebrew? You can't really get into the word of God. All those things matter, do they not? All those things are important, all those things matter. But what matters the most? What is it that matters the most? Now Jesus, when asked people, when people came to Jesus and he told them to follow me, what did Jesus say? Man, if you're going to follow me, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be a, a great time. Did Jesus say that? No, he says, come follow me and die. What matters most? His call is to you and to me what matters most. And that's the question we're going to look at very briefly here this morning. Now, when you study this text, you keep in mind that this was written, 1 Corinthians 13 was written in response to the issue of gifts, talents, and abilities in the church. The people in the church were fighting over it, discussing it, elevating some gifts over others. It was all about gifts. And then Paul comes to the point and he says, I will show you the most excellent way. I will show you what is most important. I will show you the most excellent way. Many gifts are good. Many gifts are great. But they are worthless without what? Without love. So Paul lays out in the first stanza of this great hymn to love about love in 1 Corinthians 13. He says in verse 1, If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now Paul imagined someone who was able to speak all the languages. Think about that. All the languages. Someone who can come up and converse with anyone in any language. If I can speak in the tongue of men and of angels, someone, the church needs that, the world needs that, needs someone that can communicate like that. I knew of a man, I did not know him, who knew 34 languages. 34 languages. He was able to speak in 17 of them. Was able to read in all 34 of them. Now man, that is a guy I want to be around. You know, Tom Pegg, my wife, maybe others here went into the missions field. What is the first thing you have to do when you go into missions field? You have to learn the language of the indigenous people. You have to learn to communicate with them. Here's a guy who knows 34 languages, who can go somewhere, meet someone in the airport, or meet someone in the store, and immediately converse with them. The church needs that. People need that. And yet, Scripture tells us he can be the most articulate, the most sophisticated, the brightest, yet if he speaks without love, what is he? He's a clanging symbol, a gong. Now, the interesting thing about a clanging symbol when you use, uh, you see that illustration, there was always in the, the heathen temples, Whenever you went into them, they would have a gong or a cymbal and they would smack it. And that would to get people in a frenzy. We still do the same thing sometimes, you know. Get, get people going, you know, get them really going up, up and up. But this one thing about a cymbal and a gong, they don't make music. They just make a din, whatever. Just make a loud sound. They don't make music. 
And he says, if you can speak in all these languages, articulate in all these languages, and you can discern all these different things and have not love, it doesn't matter. You are nothing. You accomplish nothing. I remember that one of the best things I ever heard is when I was reading from uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Sinners in the Hands, that was his name, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards committed never to write, preach, or talk unless it was for the glory of God and for the love of the people. He said, I will never do any of anything else but that. He was committed to that. I can tell you, not in one hand, in how many times I have heard someone get into the pulpit who can wax eloquent and have people who know him turn around and say, when he's in the pulpit, I wish he'll never get out. Oh, it's like listening to the angels speak. But when he's out of the pulpit, I wish he would never get back into the pulpit because his coarse and angry demeanor destroys like that. Very common. Very common. You know, when they do statistics, when they have people come to the greatest... Uh, teaching that you would have some of the biggest guns and they take at the end of the they, they write, they critique the person. How did you like it? Do you know that most of the best speakers, most of, not all, please don't take that way. Most of the best speakers, the most knowledgeable people, when they're graded after that in an institution setting, which is the academic setting, that they don't score as high as some of the others. And you know, and they couldn't figure out why. So they did a test and they interviewed all these seminary students, all these theologians, what is it? And the thing that came off was very clear, which is interesting, is that one thing was clear, he doesn't love us. He had no love in him. No love whatsoever. So now to me, I would be sitting there, oh man, I love listening to Billy Bob preach like that. Can he get it all together? I mean, that's something I love. But the thing is that Scripture says you can have all these gifts, all these wonderful talents, all these wonderful attributes, but if you have not love, you're nothing. And Paul turns from the gift of tongues and talks about gifts he himself appreciates. He says in verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. You know, one of the areas in churches that churches are struggling with is when churches look for a pastor the financial times out there are very difficult. It's very hard to find a pastor and pay with the benefits and to, to live in. It's, it's a real struggle. Let me tell you something. If someone came to this church, at least I hope so, and he can speak he prophetically, that he can speak the mysteries and knowledge, I hope you find the money and hire him. Because that's the person you want in the pulpit. At least that's how I would. That's the person who can easily discern to you and talk to you about the sovereignty of God and man's responsibility. He can speak to you about all these deep, profound things, articulate to prophetic. He understands which way you can go. It's people like that, people like Paul, who start seminaries missions movements, people who do all of these great things. And yet what does God say about them? If they have not love, they are nothing. 
Now that does not compute to me. Because as a man, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I usually look at the outward appearance and I'm not even aware of doing that. Now this person can do it all. Not only that, this person has faith that can move mountains. Do you hear that? Faith that can move mountains. This is the kind of person who breaks ground, who delivers people from the bondage of sin by his intellect and his ability to proclaim the gospel. We write biographies of these people. And yet, Scripture says, they are nothing without love. Tremendous gifts. If you do all that, even though people may be startled and amazed at what you can say and how you communicate, if they don't have love, they are nothing. I chose this because in this new year, as we enter into this new year, let us be mindful of what matters most. And that is love. Let us be keenly aware of that as we move into this new year. Now, all these gifts, they, they benefit greatly. For example, if I have a $50 bill and I go over to Deli Boy down the corner and I buy myself a sandwich, I give him that $50 bill, he puts it into the register. Next thing you know, he has an electrical problem. So he calls the electrician, he takes my $50 bill out of the register, gives it to the electrician to go and fix the electrical problem. The electrician leaves and goes out, fills his car up at the gas station, at the Gulf gas station, gives that to the attendant there. The attendant there takes that $50, goes to the grocery store and buys groceries and many other things. Better yet, takes that $50 and gives it to their kids that are in school or moved away so they can buy books or enjoy a night out. All these good things, all these wonderful things that $50 bill did, it went out. Then, when that person, the last person who has it, takes that $50 bill and goes to the bank, hands it in at the bank, and the bank looks at it and says, ah, oh, this is counterfeit. What happens to the $50 bill? It gets destroyed. Yet that $50 bill did many good things. That $50 bill put gas in someone's tank. That $50 bill paid the doctor for the doctor's visit. That $50 bill put some food on some food on the table. It did a lot of good. But in the end result, what happens? It's destroyed. It's worthless. It's worthless in the sight of God. It's worthless to Him. Because Jesus Christ tells us that. For Paul tells us that. The greatest of these is love. Now Paul takes it a step further. Not only do you have gifts, that you can do some wonderful things with your gifts, but you accomplish nothing without love. He goes on to say in verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Notice, here is an individual that is concerned for the poor. Or at least it seems that way. And it says, if I surrender my body to the flames. Now we read a lot of the commentaries, and I'm sure many of them 
uh, may be right, but I, I don't know. It, it was said that people would sell themselves into slavery and they would be engraved with some kind of tattoo kind of thing, meaning they belonged to someone in order to free someone else. So that's an interesting thought about that. I never knew that. That was interesting to hear. And that if I give myself in a total sacrifice, I give all my money, I feed the poor, I do all these wonderful things, but have not love, I gain nothing. The point is clear. Among all the things that matter in life, and there are many things that matter in life, the most important thing is love. We need to know in our seminaries, in our churches, in our movements, we put a great deal of emphasis on sincerity, commitment, sacrifice, service, gifts. But with all of them, without love, it matters not. Many times it has been said that many people give and do some kind of service that it is just a form of self-advertising. Now that's what they were saying back then. It's very interesting. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. I'll give you to the poor. I'll take care of that. Can you put my name on the building? Hey, uh, when, when I leave, uh, can you put my name on those windows? You know, put, put it over there so you can remember. Love matters. Now, when you look at your programs, and we just started giving out bulletins again, and I notice maybe once in a while someone writes in there, I know you're just doodling, I know you try to make me think you're taking notes, but you're just doodling. But if you, if you took your pencil and you put zeros, zeros and zeros there, you'd have zeros. <coughs> but if you took two zeros and put a one in front of it, you'd have a hundred. If you took three zeros and you put a one in front of it, you'd have a thousand. If you took six zeros and put a one in front of it, you'd have a million. The only thing that matters Scripture says to Jesus is that you love. Whatever you do, do it in love. You know, we are celebrating Christmas and this Christmas Eve we heard, we heard from God's word that God demonstrates his love for us. Again, God demonstrates his love because it's the most important thing he can do for his people. And what comes from that is our salvation. Take the smallest gift, whatever it may be, put a one in front of it, meaning it's done in love. It counts. It counts in the eyes of God. And it counts to the person you are ministering to. Of all the things that matter most, love matters most. My friends, dear friends, listen to me well to me. Take joy in that. For there is nobody in this world better equipped to love than you. Because Jesus Christ lives in you. You don't, you can't conjure this up on your own, but because he lives in you, you are equipped to love beyond anyone's understanding. I'm in awe of those gifts that were mentioned. And God gave those gifts for a purpose in building his church. He said that. But he has also enabled his people to love better than anyone else in the world because he lives in you.
as from the Holy Spirit. Of all the things that matter, love matters the most. May we be mindful of this as we go into a new year. Let's make the most important things the most important things in our lives. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house. Thank you for your word, how it ministers to us, how it builds us up. And thank you, God, for your love for us. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. We praise you. We thank you, God. Make us more like Jesus in thought, in word, and in deed. We ask this in Jesus' name.